and welcome to episode 110 of the No Clip Podcast. Daniel O'Daniel here with Jeremy Jane. Jeremy, good to have you back, dude. It's always good to be here. Yeah, we're going to talk about some video games. You've played some games. You've been mostly talking about Signalis off, off air. Uh, big old video essay coming to crew pretty soon. Uh, Frank Howley, uh, you know, hates Signalis, so it's uh, <laughs> I had to have this fair and balanced, you know. Did you ever play Signalis, Frank? I forget. Yeah, I know. I played like three hours of it, and I really liked it, but I, I started playing the game not knowing, like, exactly what it would be, so I immediately screwed myself with resources and oh, health, yeah. so it was very... I feel like I should start a new save, but... Um, I what when I did play it, I used the guide to help me get through some stuff. But nice, uh, yeah, I do want to play more. You were just shooting those motherfuckers, <laughs> using all your ammo. I I was going so. I had a similar free. experience in Dead Space. Uh, we'll talk about that today. A bunch of games to talk about today. Dead Space, Hi-Fi Rush, uh, the latest remaster or re-release of uh, GoldenEye 007, and uh, Battle Bit Remastered as well. Loads to chat about. Uh, but first of all, shout out to all of our Battle Pass holders: Jason Drury, Cody Krieger, Sven Hooster, Forrest Pruitt, uh, Andy Fegan, Cameron Ladd, George Sakotis, Jacob Godserve, Tohir Tiliev. But we're not done there. Because I put the call out for their uh, for the battle pass holders because I did them dirty and did not mention them once during our December game of the year marathons um, in the, on the podcast that uh, uh, I asked them to send in what their games of 2022 are and many of them um, actually obliged. So we're gonna we're gonna do these. Um, we're gonna s- send them out a little bit here. Uh, Andy Fegan here. Uh, Jeremy, do you mind reading this? Do you have the doc open there? Uh, I will do the second one. Let me get the doc open. Okay, Frank, catch do you up have here. the doc open? This is what this is when yes. I catch everyone out for their homework. <laughs> seeing yeah. the doc open. Uh, uh, do you, yeah, uh, Frank, do you mind reading out Andy's one here? Yeah. Uh, my game of the year was Tunic. I've avoided Souls-like games for years, but your interview convinced me to pick it up off Game Pass. I got hooked pretty fast and was finding any moment I could to go back and explore to try to fight the bosses. It's reopened the door to other games like Death Store and Elden Ring and really expanded what I've played this year. There you go. So uh, I like the idea of Tunic as a Souls like gateway drug. It's like cuz the combat's there. Yeah, it's you know, but it's it's structure isn't necessarily that, but that's pretty cool to like you know, help help them in. Uh, Cameron Lad, do you want to do that one, Jeremy? Absolutely. My game of the year is without a doubt Tinykin. It came out of nowhere and was such a delight to play, from its responsive platforming to its lovable charm. But my favorite game that I played in 2022 is without a doubt Returnal. I finally got a PS5 at the end of the year, and Returnal has been the only game I've played on it because I just can't stop. It's got to be the best action game I've played in years, and it is utterly perfect. It's like Metroid Prime meets Doom Eternal meets Alien meets Solaris. <laughs> it's a spectacle, and I wish I could say it was my game of the year 2022. Nice. Played Returnal much? Any? I have not played Returnal I... at all. I played, like, I want to say, like, five to six hours, and I loved it, but this was before they patched it to where you could, like, pause your runs oh, yeah. and so like i had one run that was so good and then i died and i was like all right i'm done with the game but i i've wanted to return to it it feels very good like and it's very it's very pretty it's very yeah pretty. i had a similar situation to you and i said i'll go back to it and then never did um but yeah it's got a lot of fans as uh, sven hooster says so the game i'd like to remain uh, recommend is dorf romantic uh, i thought a lot about this the last couple of weeks and i thought i'd recommend a game that might not be a big triple a title or even so well known although the last part may not be so true anymore considering the game got so popular they even made a board game out of it anyways the game is super relaxing city builder or rather landscape builder where you have a set of hex tiles and you need to basically match them up and uh, next to each other to create the largest possible landscape Uh, with the tiles you get. Another reason why I nominate this game is because I want to support local devs, and the studio that built this consists of just four game design students from my hometown, Berlin, Germany. Oh, and in case anyone's wondering, uh, the game launched in early access in 21, but wasn't 1.0, and officially launched until early 2022, so I hope this still counts. Yes, I played a bunch of Dorf Romantic in 2021, Absolutely loved it. Super chill. Has the vibe of like an, a perfect iPad game kind of thing. Um, but uh, very uh, fun to play. I wonder if it's a good Steam Deck game now that I think about it. That might be a good uh, a good call. Does the Steam Deck have a touchpad? You know when you have things and you just don't know if they have touchpads? It used to be like this really fancy thing. And now I'm like, maybe it has... Does the Steam Deck have a touchpad? 
I think so. I think it, it, it serves as a mouse. Like you, you, if you, it'll register as like a, a click if oh, you do it. it. You, but it, you think it, it's like it's like a it's like a binary touchpad. Like it's just all. I think so. Yeah. Can we can we can we get a can we get <laughs> some research on that screen? Do you mind googling that quick? Or you can. Oh no! You can somebody touch your, their Steam yeah. Deck. Exactly. Touch your deck. Touch your, touch deck. your deck on the podcast, Frank. <laughs> That's Show illegal, me your deck dude. and touch it. This is getting super illegal. Well, at least now we have our podcast title. That's true. Show me your deck and touch <laughs> it. What do you got, Frank? What are you going to turn on? Yeah, so I have Persona. Let me see if I can touch it. Hit play. It did, okay. and it's booting up Persona. So, so it but it worked accurately. It wasn't just like a click is just like hitting the A button. Yeah, so it's... So, I, yeah, I think I just touched it and it hit it, yeah, so... But, Maybe, but yeah. I'm saying, but t- check check something t- no. doing something else like on the menu, or something else, just to make sure that it's not just clicking the highlighted thing. Like it is actually a touchpad that like that's lit- that press any button scenario is literally the one thing we, <laughs> that we would not help with this exact brainstorming session. Can you go to the menu options? Yeah, so I can I can click around everything. And it works. And okay, so yeah, it's got touchpad. Yeah. There you go. Cool. <laughs> there you go. Maybe we're, it works with Dorfer Mendic. We're know. really getting into the facts here. Like first <laughs> first person reporting on the on the scene. We're journalists, Jeremy. I know. <laughs> I feel like it right now. We just did a journalism right now. <laughs> put it in the put it in the box. We did a journalism. That's that's one for the year. <laughs> um, Jacob Godserve, uh, do you want to do this one, Frank? Yes, uh, I haven't played many games in the past year, so a list isn't going to mean much. I would like to shout out Forbidden West. My grandfather and I have been playing it together every weekend since it came out. I handle micro-like uh, to moment controls, and he helps with macro-like strategy and gearing. There's really not much of anything either of us dislike about it. Extra history if you are still interested. A long time ago, we started this tradition with the 3D Zelda games, and Breath of the Wild was the gateway drug to the open world oh, genre. That's rad. That's very touching. I can't believe gets to play video game with his with his granddad. I never had a granddad. <laughs> they were all dead before I was born. One of them was named Danny, which is why I have my name now. Oh. So at least I got that. I didn't get to But that's such a wild ass game to be playing, which I figured like if you're playing with your granddad, you'd play like some sort of <laughs> I don't know. Dorf romantic. Is probably... yeah, yeah, something a little chiller. Yeah, it's like the uh, the meme that you'd kill a small Victorian child if you showed them an iPhone. I feel like <laughs> right. that you're putting your grandfather at risk by exposing him to AAA graphics. Yeah, he's just like, yeah, could you imagine all those, too many Ks, yeah. 4K man, too many, you know, he's just like, he's super into mechanical dinosaurs. Yeah, he's the doctor like... said he wasn't supposed to have that many polygons, you know what I mean? He's on like a low poly <laughs> diet. <laughs> Uh, do you want to take George's one? Thanks very much, Jacob. That's right. Send that, say hi to your granddad from us. That's that's absolutely so cool. Um, yeah, do you want to take this one from George, Jeremy? That's our yep. last one. Absolutely. A clear winner from last year for me, Neon White. A simple concept, brilliantly executed. I often bounce off games that rely on repetition, but there's something about this speed-running puzzle combination together with the sharp gameplay that keeps me going back. Love it. Something related to this. The Steam Deck relevant has been a revelation for me does as a parent he, does he know it's got a touch pad <laughs> i don't know we should reach out to him and let him know um <laughs> as a parent that travels quite a bit i've managed to play so many more games than i would have before including neon white it's now pretty much the only thing i'll play games on it should have been on some sort of gear of the year list gear of the year i like it um that's funny because Neon White was the game I didn't play because I tried to play it on Steam Deck and was like, oh, I need a mouse to be anyway comfortable playing this game. So that's cool, though. At least uh, George was able to find the rhythm uh, with the deck. I'm trying to think, what, what what have I played on? What are you playing on deck? You're playing Persona 4 on deck right now, Frank? Yeah, Persona 4. And then Vampire Survivors was like the other big deck game that I Speaking missed. of which, Vampire Survivors documentary coming to Noclip. We just announced it on Twitter earlier today. Um, it's already been recorded. Jesse's already doing the edit on it. Um, so we're looking forward to that. We've already ordered the puppet, which will serve as the stand in for Luca <laughs> because for, you know, some people don't want to use webcams. They're private. We totally get it. And that's when we go, we find somebody who makes video game puppets and we get them to make a puppet of the key art from vampire survivors. And then I look up YouTube videos on how to be a puppeteer. <laughs> so, you know, just your standard, normal, um, documentary coming to Noclip. Uh, fingers crossed this month. Um, we, Jeremy, we still can't talk about the one you're working on. I'm okay, that's, it's a, that's su- a shame. Is the guy who secret. made Vampire Survivors a vampire, and that's what, like can cap- can is. cameras not capture him? He's an Italian vampire. No, that actually makes sense. Like Bella yeah. Lugosi. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's very yeah. It's a Lugosi it. situation. 
It's a uh, yeah. He's been in thousands of uh, Jello movies over the years, <laughs> trying to understand and communicate with humanity. Yeah. Um. It's all just one big video game miasma. Um. Everything we talk about. This is the No Clip Podcast Expanded Universe. Um. We're here not to talk about uh, immortality though, or vampire survivors. We're here to talk about some goddamn video games that came out. It is like, I guess it's heating up now. February's got a bunch of games coming out, and then there was a couple that came out uh, that people were looking forward to in January, and then one that just kind of turned up out of nowhere. Let's talk about that first of all. Hi-Fi Rush. This game got dropped by Bethesda during their, what did they call it? It was the most generically named thing I've ever. It was a gamers direct or devs direct or something, whatever thing they did. Whereas basically Bethesda, and Microsoft had a bunch of games uh, they were showing off. They had Randy Smith out there talking about uh, why can't I remember the name of the vampire game they're making in Arcane Austin. Red Redfall. Thank you. Redfall. Showed a bunch of that. Showed a bunch of Elder Scrolls Online, which continues to be this super popular game nobody talks about. It's been like 10 years now of that. Um, and then they shot over to Tango Gameworks, uh, who the previous game they launched, we, myself and you, Frank, really quite enjoyed it, but I didn't play all that much of it. You ended up completing it. And I'm once again blanking on the name of it. I just have Bethesda amnesia over here. Oh, Ghostwire, Ghostwire Tokyo. Tokyo. Thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, and apparently in-house, one of their uh, Western devs, I guess, who who works on that team over there, pitched this project, Hi-Fi Rush, sort of a uh, rhythm action game with the craziest like variable frame rate animation stuff going on. Uh this game is rad. It's like really good. I I I get turned off by that type of like tood. You know what I mean? I like that like <laughs> hardcore tood. And I'm not really into anime stuff that much. I like you know the sort of obvious shit like bebop and Acura and stuff. But I'm not like a huge. But this game's it's hard to put down. It's so good. Uh, what have, how have you been enjoying it, Frank? How far are you? So I I think I'm on like level four, level five. Like each stage maybe is like. I don't know, it takes thirty minutes to forty five minutes, like um but I'm I'm really digging it. Yeah, I had no expectations and then this got announced. People on Twitter immediately were saying, like, Oh, this is really good. Um so I started playing it and yeah, like it, it feels like Devil May Cry but with a rhythm engine. Um and it's awesome. Like it feels like a GameCube game or very much like that Dreamcast era. It's so colorful, it's so satisfying, and there's so many little details. Like, yeah, the whole the every level like pulsates to the beat when you strike on the beat, you're you're like you, there's like the backing track makes out like a hey yeah hey, that's you're right hey. yeah yeah and it's just it's so satisfying you're constantly collecting little gears and bits and leveling up and like i always love like progression in games and so every like every time you get a critical it's like oh like two out of 100 critical strikes so you're you're there's little micro achievements and you can you can cash those achievements into upgrades so it's it's very addictive in that nature it has this like almost like Mega Man Legends like like cyber steampunk like everything's made of gears and it's all robots but it's very silly and it's cute a ratchet and clank and the, kind of the uh, yeah. yes Yes. Yeah. Very. Very much. Again, even of that PS2 platformer era, the trick though that that I did to enjoy the game even more is I'm playing it dubbed in Japanese, oh. so it's full on like an anime. Like I, I, I don't, re- I don't, I don't like watching anime like with English dub voice acting, and so I'm sure the voice acting is fine. But like to me, I'm like, no, I'm going all the way. Like I want this to be a Japanese anime. So then it feels like fully coolie, which is like a. <laughs> To that, like early 2000s anime, which was very guitar focused, and so it feels like playing a fully coolie game. But uh, yeah, and again, this was stealth dropped on Game Pass, so it was free to try, and it hooked me. Like I was playing right before we recorded, uh, even more. Uh, and yeah, it's it's I don't know, it's 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 the kind of games I like where it's like it's delicious, it's delightful, it's not imposing, it's very like fun and super colorful. Like, yeah, very very bright and happy, which is like what I'm trying to seek in video games right, right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it does a really good job of like it's funny. Like I feel like Game Pass games don't necessarily need to like win you over in a way cuz they're free, but the opening 30 minutes of this game is so tight. Like it's it it, it is like sucking you in, like inviting you in to be like, "No, no, no, trust me. You, you'll have fun with this." Like and they have to tutorial quite a lot of like stuff, but they do a pretty because it's tricky, like you're teaching people how to do like rhythm. Like at the st- it took me a little while. Like I I wasn't quite sure I was hitting the stuff right. There's basically like uh, Jeremy, you haven't seen this, right? You'd be a perfect person to explain this to, probably. Uh, I've me. seen like footage of the game a little bit, but I've not oh, played cool. it. Yeah. So the so the like Frank was saying, there's there's music playing, but the the beat is just a very implied, like I don't know, like a four four or whatever. I, I don't know drum theory, but like 
it's like imagine somebody hitting a cowbell like it's like so if you click if you click the hit button on like tap 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 that type of one and then a, there's a sort of you know i don't know what you'd call this again in, i'm not a drummer or anything but like there's a sort of a, a beat that's going at like half that rate where it's like tap 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 and if you and if you tap that in terms of the uh the slower one is kind of like the the heavy attack and the um faster sort of tempo one is the the low attack um but like it's not like the song always has that beat in it you know it has like a beat you're sort of filling it in a little bit um but it's so satisfying because you can end up chaining like tap tap and then do the other one on it and then there also is like visual cues for like there's a sort of a you end up getting this little buddy that like sort of gives you an extra like kind of final motherfucker attack right at the end but that pops up as like a you know your classic um you know rhythm game circle that is make getting small and you have to hit it when it hits the middle Hmm. um so it just creates that like you know that feedback loop when you're playing guitar hero where you just feel rad because you're hitting all the buttons at the right moment like and and the i would say the combat is not like the enemies kind of attack you one at a time so you're, it's not like you're worrying about that aspect of it too much um although i'm not as far as other people so maybe it gets a little bit crazier but it's cool it's like it's it's tapping into like a rhythm in a way that like you know we i we talk about souls combat a lot about how it's 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 based on timing but it's based on animation and this is sort of like not that difficult but it's in the same way that is like you're training yourself to look at the animation. This is you're training yourself to just like listen, yeah, um, and not look at the animation. You know what I mean? Like it's it's kind of a little bit of a reteaching yourself thing. That's cool. That sounds really interesting. Uh, there's a game I've been following for a while called Jamphibian. That's an indie game. Uh, <laughs> That's a great name. And it has a very similar system, and I've been super interested in that, so I feel like I have to check out Hi-Fi Rush. Uh, if you want to look up Jamphibian, I think it's the dev is Hayden <laughs> or Hayden, H-A-Y-D-N, if I recall correctly, but I, I'm sure it's the only Jamphibian that'll come up. So, <laughs> Well, how, how wow. you spell Jamphibian, I mean, it, it, it's literally already asking me, did you mean? Oh, uh, oh I j- found it. I yeah, okay, cool. Yep. Jamphibian. Yeah, that go. game looks awesome. And also kind of a similar like bright oh, yeah. colorful style. Yeah. Yeah, I hope that um I hope that the release of Hi-Fi Rush uh brings a new audience to Jamphibian since it's like a smaller project because they seem kind of like thematically similar and stuff. So, yeah. Awesome. Oh yeah, you're right. I see it here. Yeah, yeah. It's neat. Yeah, this is definitely sort of like feels a bit more throwback, but yeah. And and interestingly enough, it does some of the um the frame rate stuff. So I think that's what you'd be interested in as well. Like, you know, the whole, you know, when Enter the Spider-Verse came out, did you ever watch that? Yeah. So do you remember that, like, there was lots of, like, talk about how, oh, they were, like, mixing frame rates. They were, like, you know, the background stuff, a lot of it was being rendered in whatever movie frame rate, 2997 or 24, I guess it is, isn't it, for film stock. Hmm. But then, like, the animation of the character of of, uh, Spider-Man was being done in, like, I don't know, whatever animation is, 12 or 7 or something like that. And you had that. So this game does a bunch of this type of stuff. Um, uh, it also like transitions from like basically anime animation to in game, perf- like seamlessly. Like you can't. They look the, almost the exact same. They look the exact same, and the cuts are like just you know, per- like no slowdown, just immediate. Some of my favorite stuff is they'll sometimes have like the the characters in the game, the like anime characters, on like s- screens in the world. And they will be animated at like whatever twelve frames a second, but the rest of it, you're just wandering around the game, and it's like I don't know what it is, but it's just sex for my eyes. It's just like <laughs> I will stare and look at that forever. I'm like, ow, and you're like walking around. It, weirdly enough, it reminded me of a very similar thing that happened when the original Dead Space came out. I remember in Dead Space and in the new one as well, your UI is all diegetic, right? But like the whenever somebody talks to you on a video screen, it like pops up in front of you, like in the world like in front of Isaac and you can turn the camera so that you are fate you go behind the screen and you can look at Isaac through the screen and I always remember whenever I got one of those video calls I would do that I would like fuck around with it because there was just something like amazing about the fact that this screen is in the world and if you go behind it it's like reverse strike right? because it's like in the world and I am doing the exact same type of thing in this anytime that little frame rate thing happens I'm just like checking it out like it never gets old. It's wild. I don't know what that is. It's such a weird little video game thing. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a good old game. Frank, any other thoughts on Hi-Fi Rush? It's free on Game Pass. If you've got Game Pass, go check it yeah. out. Like it's Play it for 30 minutes. I think you'll know whether or not you're on board or not. 
Yeah, I will. I will say like I I like the game and and I do love like the visual uh, 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 like language of it. Like you said, like it has the Guitar Hero like ry- rhythm game thing. And I will say like I don't. I'm not always playing to the beat necessarily. I feel like it's way more. It's pretty forgiving. I feel like whereas I I feel like remember I tried playing Metal Hell Singer right. or, and I I feel like I I I, was, I got destroyed in that and that kind of put me off from like rhythm based action games. This one got me. Um and um. A really nice feature is like, yeah, you have this little robot that pulses to the beat. If you want even more, like straight up music notes on the bottom, you hit select and it just shows yeah. like the actual beat even more. So, so it's very friendly. Give it a shot. And then, yeah, like I just want more cute, colorful games. So yeah, it's, it's I really liked it. And, I'm, and I'll uh, keep playing it. And yeah, I'm, I'll probably beat it. Yeah, I liked Hellsinger a lot, but I hear what you're saying. There was kind of like a you hit it or you didn't thing in that game. Um, in this one, I think the window's pretty wide, but like you said, there's like a crit. Like if you hit, if you hit the exact moment, you get the sort of like it's like a crowd going like yeah or something right after you do it. So <laughs> yeah. you kind of know if you're right there, which is really good. It's like a you can tell they like play tested the crap out of this thing because it all you know it really sort of works. Yeah, that's a clever way to do it as well because I feel like if it was only hitting when you nail the beat, then it's kind of this negative feedback loop. Whereas like a game like that wants to get you into a flow state. Like, it wants to it doesn't want to like it wants to be difficult sometimes but it doesn't want to like bash your head if you're not doing everything perfectly so <laughs> right. having kind of like a, a fall off window where it's not a crit but you're still kind of like almost nailing it is a good way to onboard people into learning it yeah and it's probably easier to get to hitting the moment perfectly if you're allowed to be a little bit sloppy yeah. at the start you know what i mean like playing a musical instrument you know you're like oh you gotta warm up a little bit kind of thing um so yeah great little fun game like very unique and interesting and Super fascinating way to launch a game, like just to really come out of nowhere in January. Like everyone was talking about it, and I can totally see. I think this is again. I'm not sure. There's a, there's some games where like you can't really market them for two years. Mm. Like there's just not enough meat on the bone there, um, and games are getting so big. And this isn't. This doesn't feel like an expansive game or anything. It doesn't feel. I don't know. It's probably long, but it doesn't feel like a you know Redfall or a Elder Scrolls Online. These games you can like <laughs> talk about for years and years, or I guess you have to. So in a way, it was like a perfect little storm. They just kind of came out with it. Um, yeah, it's really it's really cool. Uh, Hi Fire Rush available on Game Pass now. Go check it out. Um, let's. Uh, kind of talk about Dead Space a bit because I've yeah, of course. Oh, talking yeah. a bit. Have anyone else played Dead Space? Yeah. No. I've never even played the Not original yet. Dead Space. Oh, cool. Hmm. 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 There's an argument that this is a Jeremy game. Is okay. I I love yeah. survival horror games, and mm. there are a choice few that tend more towards like the action survival horror. Like yes. Resident Evil Four is, despite the fact that I'm a fucking like, we gotta have the fixed camera, and you need like three bullets for the first six hours of the game, and like <laughs> I love games like that. But uh, Resident Evil Four just loves of... putting little girls in boxes. <laughs> yeah, I love like being creeped out and having no fucking ammo. Um. But uh, but Resident <laughs> Evil Four is one of my favorite games of all time. So I feel like Dead Space is one of those. It's a fine wine that's been sitting on my shelf for years mm. now, and it's I just don't know when to pop the bottle. Well, you could you could argue this is no better time um, for this one. Frank, what about you? You've not played this new one, but you played the old one. Yeah, I played the original. I'm eager to check out the new one, but I'm so overwhelmed with like games and other projects. <laughs> but like, I'm I'm dying to play this. Dying, I get it. Yeah, oh. yeah. yeah. Once you have the space, <laughs> once you have the space <laughs> yes. in your life for yeah. it, yeah. <laughs> and yes, we yes. figured it out. Um, so yeah, Dead Space came out. I think it was 2008. Uh, really, you know, breakthrough game for sort of uh, yeah, kind of like lighting that candle again of the the you know action orientated like survival horror type game. Um, very much inspired by like Event Horizon, like it's it's kind of Event Horizon the game in many ways. Um, uh, did a lot of very interesting things. It has basically no UI. This is all stuff from the two thousand and eight one. Basically, had no UI. All the UI was diegetic, which is quite a new thing to happen in in uh, two thousand and eight. Uh, your health bar is basically like the color of your your rig on your back. The the spine. There's like a bunch of LEDs on it. The um, readout on your gun in front of you has a little sort of holographic HUD that shows how many um, uh, shots you have left in your gun. Um, you can bring up a screen that basically is your like menu. Um, it seems in this game like it's more of a menu than maybe in the original one where they really kept it like in world. The game doesn't pause when you go into that menu, you know, like shit can still crawl up on you and stuff like that. Um uh, so technically it was doing a lot of like really really interesting things and it was super spooky and had a very interesting story 
um, the re- uh, <laughs> I'll get into it in a second, I guess. Um, and basically, uh, it was a huge game. A uh, sequel came out, which a lot of people would argue was maybe even better than the first one, and but leaned perhaps even more action. And then the third one, uh, general consensus is that they sort of jumped the shark, that it got super, super uh, more uh, action-y. There's a sort of a old wives' tale about the fact that by this stage it was making EA a lot of money, and maybe there was more... Uh, eyeballs on it and it was getting dragged in a certain direction I've never heard that corroborated but you know you can never tell Uh, a lot of those stories come from truths but also it's a popular thing to say that EA ruined the franchise so it's very very hard to tell so when they went to remake this game I think I was very interested in the announcement around this because it was around the time that the Callisto Protocol stuff Glenn Schofield over at Striking Distance was the original creative lead on Dead Space a bunch of the Striking Distance people had come from that EA studio to work on it Um. This was being developed by a different EA studio, uh, Motive. Um, but, you know, it was like, I was a little bit cynical, like, oh, cool, the original Dead Space people, or a lot of them, have gone off to make a Dead Space, uh, you know, spiritual successor, and now here are EA deciding to stir up the franchise at the same time. I did not think in January 2023 we'd be in a situation where the Callisto Protocol had had such a bad reception. Uh, apparently it sold well, but a bad reception, arguably striking distance, have had quite a bad uh PR over the past six months with regard to that too and people will be shouting the praises of this remaster um, it does a really good job I've not completed it yet I'm in chapter 8 I think that, no I'm in 9 there's 12 I think uh, so I'm, I'm almost at the end and it does a fantastic job of you know we've done a lot of remasters uh, docs over the years um, maybe we're working on one at the moment um, and the games that sort of uh, you know, don't touch anything, and then there are games that like, you know, mess with the formula, like when we did the Black Mesa doc. This does a really good job of like letting. I would say at the start of the game, it is almost. It feels very, very like not one for one, but very close to it. And the longer the game goes on, the more this deviates. And uh, the biggest change to the structure is that because now we've got modern hardware and streaming's gotten so much better that instead of the sort of levels being separated by this tram, which runs the sort of length of the space station you're in, um, now there are sort of like, almost like Soulsborne-esque corridors that loop back to where you were, that you eventually, so you don't have to use the tram a lot of time, you can actually just go back to places you were in before. Um, And that's just a byproduct of the technology now, allowing people to make these hugely expansive worlds where you can stream through. Um, But it adds to the game as well. And it means that they've changed the structure of the game as a result. There's a bit more sort of soft backtracking, I'd call it. Um, And by the end, like it feels like the, what they're doing at the moment is that in the part of the game and is like, feels super fresh and new and weird and interesting. So, um, I think if you're going to play Dead Space, this would be the way to do it. Uh, it's It's got all the like modern trappings. It looks great. You know, it's got, you know, really good sort of, uh, you know, we've gone so well with, with black levels and HDR and, and, you know, luminosity and all the different types of dynamic lights that are in games now. Uh, there's less of the sort of like brown fog that sort of like try, you know, the highlights which you know, the shadows which weren't, they'd have to bring the light up on the shadows in those games because we were all playing on shitty CRT TVs or whatever, um, which in a way kind of worked for the aesthetic of Dead Space because it has a sort of a, you know, you know, Event Horizon, like all those high, uh, sci-fi games that came in that era before LCD screens. So y- you had a sort of a U- UHF, VHF sort of aesthetic to the screens. So it kind of does that a little bit. Like there's a lot of static and noise and radio transmissions in this game, which you know, perhaps isn't accurate, <laughs> you'd imagine, to these, like, huge planet-cracking uh, space stations. But, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's you know, I think it, it's it's a pretty much a bet as good a remaster as you could probably, or remake, I should say, as you could probably ask for. So the reason I think this might be a Jeremy game is that, do you know anything about, like, the story of Dead Space or anything? <sighs> um, I feel like people have like pitched it to me and i've gotten a little bit of it but i feel Mm. like it's been sufficiently long now that i've memory hold it like i've replaced it with other information that's irrelevant to my everyday life and so i've I've pushed it out and now i'm fresh i'm a blank slate for it okay well i'm not probably not going to say any i won't say anything too too much then but like no you can pitch me on it you go ahead so the reason I think it might be a good Jeremy game is obviously like survival horror games, yeah. right? That's that's a good. It is more on the action side, so that's you know that is what it is. But I think the world, and it's hard to tell if this does it as well because I'm not reading the text logs as much as I did in the first game because I 
I, I know what the fuck's going on, basically. Um, but the central sort of, like Event Horizon, kind of, the central... Um, have you seen Event Horizon? Yes, not in a very long time, though. Okay. Uh, uh, the central sort of um, conflict is based around uh, a sort of religious interpretation of something mystical that has appeared. And, you know, there is a sort of religion that exists on Earth during this time that is they see something which is kind of from the scripture and they're like you know doing terrible things in re- to like sort of placate this force um uh, and i think that stuff is super interesting uh, and, and cool and i forget how deep into it th- i feel like dead space 2 gets more into it so maybe i'm sort of projecting a little bit but um i think yeah i think it'll be a fun game to pick up and have a go, and uh, yeah, I assume now they will, it seems to have sold really well, I assume they will go on to do Dead Space 2, and uh, perhaps, uh, by the looks of things, do their own take maybe on a Dead Space 3 if it works out. Um, we'll have to see, but I'm, yeah, two I'm, thumbs up. I'm realizing that uh, from our conversations from Game of the Year and a few other talks we've had on the pod recently, how prevalent a theme religion, but it's all fucked up is in video games. <laughs> yes, <Yeah>, right? <laughs> it's like so pre- so prevalent. Dude, I there's a couple of games from last year that we haven't even. I feel like you should also play Norco. Yeah, no, Norco is on my list. I've played the first yeah. like 15 minutes. I had a staring contest with a uh, sock puppet monkey, and that was about as far <laughs> as I got. Um, <laughs> yeah, I but I do need to play that. the rest of it. I I like the tone and aesthetic of it. It's one of those games where when it's like text heavy games, narrative heavy games, I have to be in the right mindset. So it's kind of a, yeah. you know what I mean. I'm waiting for a uh, for a special mood. Yeah, I can I can imagine there being a Norco um a video essay. It's it's one of those. It's very there's a lot there's a lot of Norco's wild. Awesome. Norco goes fucking places, man. Uh yeah. Any other questions, thoughts about Dead Space? Frank, you got any uh any any you thinking yeah, about tr- it? You got- I'm trying to remember like um are you finding it difficult? Are you combing through it? Is it one of those games where it keeps you like dangling off the edge the whole time? Are you are you how are you, how is your experience playing? I, so I'm playing on medium um cuz I I've played a lot of these games in the past so I didn't feel the need to like I just wanted to see what the game was like and I was like a fucking pig through warm strawberries for the first like 5 <laughs> hours. Like like I was like oh this game is like I was trying to think like am I just better at games now or do I know Dead Space and I'm not scared of it? Because I kind of know where all the jump scares are, and I know what's going to happen. Like, and I did. Like, I knew. I think it's it's a good example of just how well designed that opening couple of hours of that original game was. That I remembered almost every beat. It was like so sharp. Um, but uh, I have found the difficulty has like ramped up, and I don't know if it's because I was so willy nilly at the start that I was just like, I'm the fucking boss of Dead Space. I'm just like, pew, pew, pew. I shoot off your legs. I know how to kill you. I know how to do you. I know how to use this and that. Um, and maybe I was so sloppy uh, that by the time it sort of the anti adopt, I, I wasn't really aware. But I've had a bit more trouble, you know. I don't like wasting money on ammo, and I want to buy all the rigs and the upgrades and all that sort of stuff. But I'm just finding myself buying ammo a lot more now. Um, one of the things that they took from Dead Space Two, which is good, is that you also have this sort of like like a force power kind of thing. The suit that you wear, the guy you wear is basically an engineer who's brought in to like fix the ship, and the the sort of. Uh, the um i don't know convenient premise of the game is that all the um baddies are these sort of like multi-limbed freakish things and you don't have any guns but what you do have is these tools that are used for like fixing ships so you're just like using plasma cutters to chop their arms off as they come towards you and they chop their legs off and then they crawl towards you and then you chop their fucking heads off or whatever and then you the be- maybe the best maybe my favorite way of like getting stuff out of a body is that if you hit right click at any stage he just uses his big fucking boots and just stomps the <laughs> ground so you can just stomp on things and like gun bullets will come out of them you know um or you can just stomp on them while they're like coming for you and shit um but one of the things that they had on the suit is that is a sort of it's called a stasis module i think and it's basically like a like a power up you can use to like um i think it has a bunch of different yeah you can like m- make things go slow motion for a second um, or you can, so like machines are worrying, you can slow them down and get through them or doors that are opening and closing fast. Uh, but also uh, you can pick things up. And in the original Dead Space, when you pick things up with this almost like force power where you pick things up and you, you can throw them and use them as weapons, that used to take out of the stasis. It used to like deplete it. But in Dead Space 2, they made the pick up part not do it. You could just kind of do it whenever you wanted. So they've done that in this one too. They've So, so that's something I need to do more. It's just like pick shit up and throw it at 
at baddies because I could do that as much as I want. Um, but I'm just I've I think I've been slow to do it. There's a couple of boss fights in here as well that are a little bit like uh, gotta do them exactly that way. Or I was running out of ammo and I had to backtrack to get more ammo and resave and stuff. But um, I just you know it's just because I'm. Games have gotten so good at getting out of the way that, like, whenever they get in the way, I'm like, Mah! but I just need to be like more patient. It's not their fault. Can we, um, before before we move on from Dead Space, can we share John Carpenter's? Oh my review god, of oh, yes, Dead Space? of course, it, it happened. <laughs> we willed it into existence. So, yeah, I, hell yeah. Yeah, we, I, we, we, like a, a few weeks ago, we talked about John Carpenter's. Like every six months, he'll randomly review a video game. So uh, did, this did, is John. Did Carp- we say yeah. that he would like Dead Space? I feel like I, I think feel we like that might have come up. <laughs> I think that came up. I think we were saying like, or Signalis maybe? Probably both. Yeah, I, just, yeah. I don't know. But anyway, I, we got so many, I feel like half of Twitter <laughs> added us when this happened, which was pretty cool. So this was January 29th, John Carpenter at the Horror Master. <laughs> EA's refurbished, <laughs> that's, that's his username. EA's refurbished Dead Space is exciting and scary. Great game. Refurbished. Refurbished is the best nomenclature for this. It's I, the the <laughs> thing that it immediately made me think of was like it's it's like an old iPhone that got fixed up or something. Like it's not a yeah. it's not that they remade the game. It's that they took the old thing and were like ah this thing's like fine. Dust it off and like <laughs> exactly. like open it up and blow all the dust out. <laughs> refurbished. I love it. I love John. It's Carpenter. like he was reaching for the word. It's just you can tell he plays games, but he's not like a gamer because he's like, "Is it a remaster? Is it a remake?" And he's like, "Oh, what is this thing? Oh yeah, a refurbishment." <laughs> yeah. It's like, like it's an old sofa. Yeah, exactly. Reupholstered. Yeah, it's, a, it's a printer. Yeah, with, uh, that's being sold on Amazon for half the price. Amazing. Um, <laughs> thank you, uh, John Carpenter, man in the field for no clip. John, John Carpenter out there doing the good work. Um, speaking of refurbishments, Frank Howdy, GoldenEye 007. Oh, Tell yeah. us all about it. Oh, man. Th- this was also another thing that, if, to, to me, was a surprise drop on Game Pass. I feel like months ago they announced, like, okay, no, this is finally coming out. Like, the history with GoldenEye 007 has been crazy because that, like, refurbished, whatever, the, the remake remaster <laughs> was, was like, blocked by Nintendo. I feel like a decade ago there was supposed to be an Xbox Live arcade oh, yeah. port coming out. And then last minute, Nintendo was like, nope, we still have the rights. And then every year at E3, there would be like, hey, I think Xbox is going to announce Goldeneye. I think it's gonna, for a decade. And then at some point, like that 360 build leaked. You can track it down. And then at other points, people have just straight up modded Goldeneye 64 so you can play mouse and keyboard. Finally, Nintendo, everyone like, I don't know, shook hands or agreed it's coming out. So this. This month, two different versions of the game dropped. Okay. GoldenEye 07 on Switch, which that's the only version that has online multiplayer. Um, but the control scheme is similar to how it was on N64, so it, it probably sucks to play. <laughs> the version on the version on Xbox Game Pass, no online multiplayer, but it, they they reworked the controls so it plays like any console, you know, twin stick uh, oh, first wild. person shooter. So it's it's so easy and fun to play. Um, in terms of the graphics, like it's it, it just feels like a pretty much a straight port. Maybe it's softly polished, but like it's it's it looks like an N64 game, but but clean, I guess. Um, yeah, it's it's really fun playing, and I realized as I started playing it that this is the first time in my life I've played GoldenEye 07 without cheats, um, because GoldenEye was like my my second first person shooter as a kid. My first was Doom on Super Nintendo, right. and then GoldenEye was on N64. But I had a Game Shark. I was like five or six. I had no idea what to do, so I would always put on like infinite health, infinite guns, infinite ammo, like, and 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 in GoldenEye you can beat the level without doing all the objectives. You just won't unlock the next level. But I always use a, a level select mode or whatever. So I would just go through. So as I was playing the game this week, I was like, I realized I've never done the ob- I Maybe. I, maybe I forgot. But I had never like actually played the game by its own rules. So um, it was funny to find. It feels like I'm discovering the game for the very is first it, time. It, I, I've <laughs> like, always, it's pretty yeah. tricky, is it? Dude, like, like you, yeah. I mean, there's some weird, like... Because of the graphics, you can't tell what like computers you need to yeah. access with or what items you need to do. You have to go in your inventory and pull up like like key cloning programs. You have to throw. It's so weird, but it's like kind of charming because it's like they're figuring it out too. Like this is such an early 3D first person shooter. Um, and like one thing I find so funny is just the AI in the game. You enter a room and like the enemies will like do this like slow motion ass jump, turn around, try to shoot you, and like you can obliterate them with with like the modern controls. So like <laughs> right, it's <yeah>. very funny. <laughs> <laughs> and like 
Yeah, I don't know. It's like Goldeneye always has been one of my favorite games, and it's fun jumping back in to be like, no, it's it's still charming. The 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 craziest thing with this is like my sense of like space. As a kid, these levels felt massive. Like, oh my god, these are huge, sprawling spaces. Now I'm playing. It's like these levels are so tiny and like basic, but it's like. <laughs> Like, you know, like nowadays, like literally with like Halo Infinite where it's open world or just, I don't know, like having gone through Black Mesa recently, which is like a massive 30 hour campaign. It's like, geez, this is like, this is like so, so like, I don't know, bite size in comparison. But uh, yeah, I'm really liking it. Again, it was released on Game Pass, free to dive in. And I think I'm like halfway through it. The soundtrack above all is so good. Does it have all the bits? Um, Like it has the original actor, like Sean Bean is still in it and all that sort of stuff? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like the graphics, everyone has these like block faces, but like a a scan of their face. Um, with no, that show, I think it's just default. They don't, I don't think they like show emotion. It's just the basic face and then they'll have like dialogue text boxes. Um, but yeah, again, it was, it was a crazy weekend because Hi-Fi Rush and Golden Eye dropped the same weekend. So it's been kind of fun dipping back and forth. Uh, and the best part is you're getting achievements in this. This is the oh, first course. time I played Golden Eye 07 getting achievements. So every time you beat a level, it, boop, achievement unlocked. Um, and so part of me wants to like dedicate myself to trying to get all the achievements. That does mean learning how to speed run, play the levels on harder difficulties, but uh, I've never like really rinsed the game in this way. So I'm, I'm kind of interested in it. It's wild. It, it almost feels like a, you know, we're talking about the Dead Space remaster. Like maybe this was a bit of a missed opportunity to, like it seems like having this game, like it's cool that they basically have an emulated version out and it's free and all that sort of <laughs> stuff. But like, yeah, I don't know. I wonder because I wonder would people play this online or would they play it online for like ten minutes and then never play it again? <laughs> you know, so yeah. maybe, maybe this is just the way it should be. Goldeneye Double Seven is always a funny one for me because I couldn't give less of a fuck about this game. Really? Cause I because I was playing PC first person yeah, shooters. Fair enough. So to me, this was dog shit. I was like, <laughs> like when people, you know, I get it. It's like it's like your first Mario Kart. It's your, you know, your the best Mario Kart and your first first person shooter is your best first-person shooter. And guess what my first first first-person shooter was? Fucking Half-Life. Yeah, fair enough. So I was, like, ruined for the rest (laughs) of my life. So by the time Goldeneye came out, and I didn't own an N64, and I I knew some people who had it, and I was probably jealous as well, right? So I wanted it to (laughs) suck. But I remember, like, people talking about Goldeneye and being like, how do you do anything? Like, it's, like, hard to... The controls are hard, and the graphics look, like, ass and but then people would talk about like you know golden gun mode online and playing you know in a dorm room and all this stuff. and i was like yeah, okay i get it like it's like when people talk about halo 2 multiplayer i'm like oh yeah okay that's my unreal tournament like because i can see if you objectively look at unreal tournament you'd feel nothing it's just like a it looks so weird and there's no like theme to it and it's just a bunch of stuff but like when i look at unreal tournament i see like youth and joy and you know endless summers and playing bots until like wanted to fall asleep like so i get it i've never i never held it against anyone they like w07 but like it it does it doesn't i just find it very funny because it's got like uh bronham in it's got a uh what, <laughs> i can't remember his actual name i'm using the adam and joe reference what's his name with pierce, pierce brosnan, pierce brosnan. brosnan. Yeah. i should know the fucking this is doubtfire the fame the Irish actor with the English accent. He's a he's a a favorite. Um, uh, Goldeneye was from one of my Navin, I think. I, I loved Goldeneye growing up, and I but I totally agree with you. The control scheme is so janky, and I was just trying to think back, like how young I was playing it, and just I can't remember the year it came out, but I can tell you that I learned left and right, like the difference between left and right from Goldeneye because there was oh a, there was a tank level where you could easily get lost and I had to like write down like you go left and then right and then right and then left and then left and <laughs> I had to like that's so Goldeneye taught me left for right that's how young I was playing it so wow I also remember getting lost a ton I remember especially um there's a level in a graveyard Frank maybe since you've okay oh, yep. so it's it's Statue yes. Park, which I stopped playing because I didn't want to give myself anxiety. It was like I it is so level. dark and murky and like N sixty four dark, which is like <laughs> right. it's just mud. And I remember there you have to like find Trevelyan in like a box car somewhere, Trevelyan. and you're just walking around. I I used to walk around for like an hour, and I'm sure that level is like ten square feet, and just could not find this dude. Um, but I have very fond memories of it. It's a like you said, it's one of those games that and Perfect Dark were both kind of like go out and play until the streetlights 
come on and then you know come home with my friends and play that split screen and stuff so I'll, did, did you had an you had an n64 as well yeah n64 was okay. i i didn't have a ps1 in fact i only had a ps1 sometimes because my dad both my parents were teachers that worked at schools and at my my dad worked in the town where like they were like kind of known for having like kind of a rougher element so the school right. he was at had a program to work with kids who were like kind of you know like fucking off after school and doing messed up shit to kind of like reach those kids where they would have a, a lab like a computer lab but it was all playstations and they would oh, have educational games so they're like Gosh. hey man like school is not cool you're right but you know what is cool is playstation and they're like oh yeah that playstation is sick and they're like all right well what about like number blasters on play you know what i mean oh my god uh, i wonder what playstation edutainment games there were. i know i'll have to ask my dad if he remembers um but uh, wow. he would bring it home every summer and or for a few summers and i would have like just for the summer a ps1 with a bunch of educational games and like Star Wars <laughs> Masters of Terrace Kasai or whatever. Oh yeah, Terrace Cassie or whatever. Yeah. It's, I, yeah, I never know. That's one of those ones as well that like that game came out, the, the Masters of what it, whichever way it was, before there was video of and podcasts of games. So I feel like we all pronounced things yeah, totally, totally different because we were reading yes. them all. Yeah. yeah. So I have no idea what that one is. I'm sure there's some Star Wars fans in the in the listenership that let us know. I also love the idea that both your te- both your parents are teachers, but it was Alec Tre- Trevelyan that taught you left and right. Yeah, for sure. That's he was pretty... I he was a father figure that I needed in my life. <laughs> Good old Sean Bean. <laughs> Everyone's father figure. Father figure in Game of Thrones and you know. And also rural Massachusetts. Um <laughs> Golden I 007 available now. Um, uh, I want to give a quick shout out to Golden Era, which is a, a video game documentary. I mean, if you if you listen to this podcast, perhaps you enjoy video game documentaries. Golden Era was a, a kickstarted, I want to say, um, uh, documentary which ended up coming out. Uh, um, I think it was was it a couple of years ago or was it last year? I'm not quite sure, but it's a documentary about. The history of Golden Eye 007, um, I believe it is available on Amazon. You can go rent it, you can buy it, um, support your local video game documentarians, uh, and we're, we'll pass the uh, pass the word along. Um, uh, you can go check that out. It's called Golden Era. Uh, okay, that's almost all the games. Jeremy, I'll get to you in a second on Battlebit. I want to briefly talk about Choo Choo Charles. Next week, I'm heading up to rural Washington, Kitsap County, to talk to the Dwarf Fortress brothers about Dwarf Fortress. Uh, and while we're there, I'm also going to um, check in on the Choo Choo Charles developer, um, who we did have on this podcast a number of uh probably about two years ago at this start well, i was i guess it was a year ago or so two star games is the name of his studio um but uh i'm excited to do it but i had not properly played the game yet i wanted to like sit down and enjoy it and um i am absolutely loving it i can't put it down it's very much a one person made this game type of game it's a lot of fetch quests but i love the atmosphere the central theme of it is hilarious. There is a huge train spider thing called Charles with a weird face that lives on this fucking island. And the island is full of people who are waiting for you to turn up to kill Charles. And the way you go around this island is on your own train, which goes on tracks around the island. And there's like a bunch of places where you can go left and right. And you go up to these NPCs whose mouths don't move, but they're voice acted. And they give you these quests of like, go in that mine and collect some scrap. And like, it's all very like easy to do. But every once in a while you hear this like haunting, <laughs> like the mist on the fucking hill. And you see this fucking thing coming at you. And you're like, shit. You have to like drive your train away and like run to the back of the train and like get on the machine gun and shoot this prick until he goes away. And you're upgrading the train, and it's like I think I'm I'm very excited to talk to him about it because I think it is a when we talked about this two year, or a year ago, or whatever, when I interviewed him, um, his fear was that like he's, he basically made this like meme joke about this game, um, and then people were like, you have to make the game, so he was like, okay, I'll go make the game, but he was like. He's a young dude, and he was like, "I don't want to fuck this up. This opportunity to be, you know, everyone's waiting for you to fuck this up when you when you have a meme game sort of kick off." And I think I'm really impressed by the scope control. That like this game has rough edges. You know, the faces don't move, animate. There's a lot of repeated textures, all that sort of stuff. But like, it's definitely more than the sum of its parts. Like, like he had a really good vision. And from what I've played, I've played I don't know maybe two hours. I think it's only three or four hours long or something like that. I'm doing loads of the side quests. I'm just really enjoying. Like, I think I think it was a very it's a very smartly designed game. Like, I think he's 
he's sharp and this probably game probably did quite well it looks like it's done a lot of you know i think it's 20 bucks and it has like a couple of thousand reviews on steam so um it's probably made him a decent amount of money as well but i think outside of that this he seems like a sharp developer especially for his his experience in the industry so it's not his first game he's really started games on steam before but it's definitely the biggest like big 3d kind of uh, you know open world trained spider game so um yes my initial impressions are uh very i yeah i guess if i think about the price of the game i can might be like yeah maybe it's a bit you know but i think it's 20 bucks is something like that i believe it is and and it feels a bit closer to a high polished game you'd you know, like a Szymanski game who released it for five or ten bucks. I would, I five would be too less. I'd say this feels like a ten or fifteen. But then, you know, Steam sales are your friend. I think when it comes to this, mm. um, uh, yeah, it's very. One of the funny things is if you look it up on Metacritic, it's got like five out of ten. You go to um, Steam and it has very positive nine thousand reviews. So, I think if you know what this game is when you go into play it, it totally, totally hits the marks. Um, at least it is for me. Uh, super impressive, all developed in Unreal by one d- dude. Um, yeah, so I'm excited to head up there and talk to him about it. Uh, and I was uh, excited and relieved that I enjoyed the game so much as well. <laughs> I wanted to play it right before I went up, so I had everything fresh. Uh, Jeremy, tell us a bit about Battle Bit Remastered. This is 100% coming out of nowhere for me. What is this? Okay, first of all, as an aside, apologies to Bella Lugosi and everyone from Romania. He's not Italian. He's not an Italian vampire. He's Romanian. Oh, Fact-checking okay. myself from earlier. Okay. Like most vampires, he's Romanian. Yeah, exactly. But, like, also, was it Romania when he was originally a vampire? I don't know. He you, could be you know, thousands like of, of years old. Yeah, he could, like, I feel like most of European countries, you know, it was all just, you know, Christendom. Yeah, he could have been <laughs> part like, of some empire. Uh, who knows? Exactly. Um, it, yeah, who knows? Holy Roman Empire probably yeah. was, but at the time he was getting... Yeah, Makes whatever. sense. Um, and all right, th- that was just a brief intermission about vampires. Back to Battlebit. Yeah, so important. Battlebit Remastered is a game that I've been watching for a long while. It is a uh, an indie battlefield successor. They describe it as sort of a legacy battlefield game. It is essentially oh. trying to recapture the magic of battlefield games, sort of around the era of uh, Battlefield Two. Uh, but it's also got fully destructible environments. Um, oh, so it's my it's essentially. Battlefield 2 with the uh, okay the only thing that bothers me about it but I know it's a it's a product of the the scope of the team it's only three people making this and the presentation style of the game reminds me of Roblox there's there's no way to get around that okay and that definitely is like it was a hang up (laughs) for me like the characters the characters the environments themselves I don't it doesn't bother me that they're blocky and kind of like flat textures but the characters themselves look like fucking Duplo like Lego men can I ask you a quick question? Of course. Does this look like the aesthetic of Teardown? Okay, that's it? what I was just about to mention. Teardown. Okay, yes. okay. Uh, it is essentially it, it is it feels like Teardown Battlefield with less good lighting than Teardown. Uh, but I <laughs> I recognize that the restraint in the aesthetic dimensions of Battlebit is the only reason they're able to make a you know 128 person per team Battlefield successor with a team of three people. Uh, mm. So I, I'm willing to overlook it. There, for a long time, I've looked at the Battlefield series and wondered why no one else has kind of stepped in to take up the mantle. Because it seems like uh, Battlefield 2 and Bad Company 2 were kind of the last ones that I loved. Uh, a lot of people have a lot of love for Battlefield 3, um, but like 4 and 5 and Battlefield 1. There are people who really love them, but it is... I'm the old man over here. I'm like, let's talk about Vietnam and Desert Combat. Dude, I... Yeah, okay. I If you want to go way back, I was super into those. I also loved uh, Project Reality, which was a, a mod for BF2 that kind of like stripped out a lot of quality of life features. It was not, I wouldn't describe it as fun. It involved a lot of like <laughs> listening to like an overly invested, you know, middle aged man from the Midwest yelling at you over microphone to dig trenches and stuff. Uh, wow. Just like, just like your childhood. Just like my childhood. Exactly. That's probably why I like it so much. Um, <laughs> but I, anyway, this game uh, is it's not even in an early access yet. It's going into early access later this year. Uh, so currently the only way you can play it is request access and play on their playtest servers that they, okay. they all, so they have playtest windows. And so part of the reason that I was interested in this is not only my interest in battlefield, uh, I probably would have just waited till it was an early access, but our, our stunt derby play tests for the game that <laughs> no clip is overseeing that Alex Austin is developing. Um, they've, those play tests have been like, some of my favorite experiences playing games in a long time. <laughs> Me too. Like they're so Me too. fun. Um, 
and it's it's not only getting to see the game develop but it's also the the kind of like small dedicated community sometimes when you hop into especially with like bigger franchises like battlefield or like call of duty if you hop into a game in one of those it feels like you're just playing with any old per- like it's such a large community there's no sense of kind of like right. intimacy or like per- personal nature of the thing and with stunt derby it's like oh yeah that's that guy who made the track that we're racing on and he's like telling me about what he was thinking when he designed it um which arguably if you think about games like battlefield 2 it kind of felt like that then too yeah or like when I was playing Battlefield Vietnam online, and granted I played in like European tournaments and stuff, but like even random games, it kind of felt like people are here for this game. Yeah. It's not like it wasn't like there was two or three big shooters like there is now. There was kind of like too many of them, and you were happy if you just got enough people together for a kickabout, you know? Yeah, yeah. It wasn't just like the default game. It was like a, people who played it were very passionate about it. And I, mm. I had the same thing. I played competitive Battlefield two for a while, and uh, the the commu- I st- me and my friend still joke about this one guy whose name just like stuck in our head to this day. We like reference. It's like a meme in my friend group of this guy that we haven't talked to in like twenty years. Um, but uh, so like those. Can you say his name, or are you worried he might be less? No, if a uh, killer bud, if you're out there, buddy, <laughs> we bud. we looked him up. He he like makes fucking motorcycles in the Midwest now and has like a family oh and gosh. stuff. But uh, yeah, killer bud. Killer bud. Uh, yeah, his he'd always say the problems on your. People would be like, hey man, I'm like getting laggy. He'd be like, yeah, problems on your end, dude. Like I don't know what to tell you. Um, <laughs> that was like his line. Uh, Love it. So anyway, so I've been playing the playtest for Battle Bit, and it's incredibly fun and it really it really does feel like a, a tear down battlefield game the fully destructible environments are really cool uh the the game feel like the shooting just feels like battlefield 2 it, it just feels like they just kind of nailed it uh whoever the engineer of the three is is just clearly very incredibly talented um awesome it's got vehicles they just had helicopters i think it's uh it's going to be a really interesting project to watch, and it's all it's a uh, Patreon funded. So that's the thing I was wondering oh, about: you're kidding. is how the fuck they're getting money to make this because it's such a big project, but it's they're not selling it anywhere. It's not in early access yet. Uh, so their Patreon pulls in like eighteen k, nineteen k a month. Um, Whoa! I know it's a big Patreon. Uh, so that's amazing. Yeah. So, so you get access to access to Patreon only content in game, sneak peek photos of upcoming releases, full game Steam key at early access. Yeah. So that's, yeah, 50, wow. So it's only 15 bucks a month. So they're actually bringing in 18 grand, but they only have 2,000 pages. Yeah, which is crazy. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so it's an interesting project. I've watched it for a while. I only have started playing the playtest this week um, because, as I mentioned on a couple podcasts ago, I've been playing a lot of Apex Legends. And the, yeah. the thing that I like about it is kind of the flow of battle moving from, like, they're in this building, we're in this building, and we need to get there, but these are the potential dangers along the way. Like, working with a squad to kind of formulate a plan and having this mental map of the flow of battle uh but with apex legends if you you know if that plan doesn't go well then it's the game's just over and i like the flow of battlefield games where it's like this is the front of this battle we're like trying to take this hill or something so yeah do you like spawn on commanders and or squad mates squad leaders or whatever yeah. or that type of thing? yeah you okay. can spawn on squad mates and uh it has a so in battlefield 2 the only person who could revive was the medic with the shock paddles yeah. anyone can revive in this but there is a bleed effect which is nice so uh you can bandage bleed to keep yourself from dying but only medics can heal which is nice because cool. it keeps from like sometimes in those games people just stay really far away and poke at each other for too long and having like a finite amount of bandages and only the medics can heal it like it incentivizes making the push before it's too late. That's great. I was a medic in Battlefield 2 whenever I played it. So, And one of the things I didn't like was that you were basically being given out to if you weren't getting to people on time. Yeah. Like you were con because you were the only person with the paddles. So you were like, so you felt like you, there was very little opportunity for actually getting involved in the, sh- in the shit. Kind of only as a last resort kind of like, oh, they're bearing down on us. So you got to get involved. Um that's cool. It looks great. Yeah, the videos of it are great. I'd suggest anyone go over to go over to Steam page and add to the wish list or request access. Um, yeah, Battle Bit Remaster. Don't like the name. I don't like the name, and I don't like the aesthetic. It's got so many things that are like I don't love about it. But play, uh, just like put your hands on this game, and you'll be like, oh yeah, it's this is like charming. And uh, I mean, it's like an indie battlefield. It's just like, and it yeah. it's, it, it is exactly what it presents itself as. It's funny. I like how they're... I wonder if there's an element of, like, we are... Because, like, we're all getting old now, and there's all these kids who grew up playing Roblox yeah. and Minecraft who are now sick. Well, Minecraft, that's that's a whole other generation, but, like, the Roblox kids who are now getting sick of, you know, aging out of that and wanting something a bit, you know, 
a pro bit, bit different and interesting tactically maybe but maybe the aesthetic works for them or something yeah I, I, I definitely, sure. it definitely feels like that Roblox aesthetic. And for me as a 32 year old man, that's definitely like a little <laughs> bit of a turnoff, but I'm willing yeah. to overlook it. Love it. For me, I think it's really funny and cool where I'm like, oh my God, I want to, I want to <laughs> shoot these things. Like, <laughs> like this looks awesome. Uh, is there, is there blood or gore in this or is it just There's like, kind of like the, I think the only blood would be like the screen turns a little red when you're bleeding. I don't, okay. yeah, I think it's pretty. There's not in Battlefield. Yeah. In fairness. Like, yeah. The, the Battlefield games have never really done that. Yeah. Right? Although it would be very funny if there were kind of these blocky, low poly characters and they're like, oh God, my arm. Like, yeah, uh, tell my yeah. wife I love her. It's <laughs> like really traumatic well, yeah. and gory. Even the old ones didn't. Sometimes you'd end up like with like piles of dead bodies. Yeah. Um, especially when you're playing the AI and you had an you had a Huey. <laughs> you were just gunning them down while listening to Credence over and over and over again. Those are the days. Man, uh, those are the days. Spe- speaking of Battlefield, Battlefield 2069 or whatever. 2069. The, the one is. <laughs> Jeez. 420. Uh, 2069. Is that yeah. what you just said? They, yeah, I, I think it's 2042. I don't know. What, whatever year it is. They finally like patched it so there's classes again after like two years of it being like. I I, yeah. I I will give the new Battlefield games a shot every time, and it's like it's always like I don't know tragic to see like the 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 dis like I don't know I, I like look at the Reddit's and they're very like, angry, but they finally patched this new Battlefield to put classes in. So part of me is like, one, are people still playing this? Two, are people going to give this a shot? Like, I don't know. I, I'm tempted to like re-download it and give it another shot. It's uh, it's only twenty bucks for the next. Uh, actually, no. By the time this goes up, it'll be back up to full price. So <laughs> scrap that. It is on EA Play, though. I think so. If you're part of EA subscription service, which I am, which is why I got oh, ten Dead quid Space. off Dead Space. Mm-hmm. No, it's not for free. You just you just Aww. get a little bit off it. That's why I did it on Microsoft because that's annoying. Because EA Play is, I think, also I think it might be platform specific because I can only get it on. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, uh, <laughs> all reviews on Battlefield is 129,000 reviews, and they are mostly negative. Ooh. Recent reviews, 4,000 or so uh, mixed. Yeah. So, so I guess that's pro- that's trending in the right yeah. direction, but not quite sure. You know. But also, hey, got 130,000 reviews. That means 130,000 motherfuckers bought the game, and that's probably 2% of the amount of people who actually bought the game. So... Hey, I guess that works if you're... Maybe that's the EA way. Doesn't matter if people <laughs> like the game as long as they keep buying it. Uh, John Madden Football coming out. Uh, there you go. Battle Bit Remastered. Guys, we had a bunch of fun games this week. Yeah, a lot of good games. We had a bunch of fun games. Um, We need to do more of these like little Let's Plays and shit over on Crew because I feel like there's so many games coming out now. I want to... I wanna, I'm not sure Battle Bit might be one you probably can't do because it's like private testing and all that. Yeah, I'm not sure. There's a lot of people fair. that do YouTube videos about it, so maybe, mm. but it yeah, I don't know. I don't I I feel like I'd rather give it a little space to develop before we give it a yeah. give it a look like that. Maybe eventually you can reach out and, and give them a Yeah. tap on the shoulder and say, "Hey, can we highlight?" It is funny. I don't we don't talk about Stunt Derby on here. We play Stunt Derby every week on Fridays. If you're part of the Noclip uh, Patreon by the way, this isn't a a pitch out of nowhere. If you're part of the Patreon, you can get your key. Like we have keys for all patrons now. Um, I said it was up until a certain day, but that was just because I didn't want to have to be like, you know, have a noose around my neck for it for like the the next, you know, but if you DM me on Patreon, like I'll send you a key to Stunt Derby. It's no problem. But we do, and usually noon Pacific on Fridays, sometimes it's 3 p.m. Pacific. Um, if we're running a little bit late, uh, we do play tests. Um, all of us are usually there, a bunch more people, Alex, they're super fun. Um, he was over here on Monday adding in a bunch of uh, stuff for me for like trailers and pitch decks to publishers and stuff. And he we got he basically fixed he changed all the physics so it's multi thread now so it uses like multiple cores on a CPU. And then we ran it on my machine over there that's got sixteen cores and uh, had two hundred cars against ten thousand boxes. And I made like a hill for them all to drive down. And then they it's like it's like watching World War Z. Do you remember the the Brad Pitt one where like it's not a great movie, but they had like these like hordes of zombies that were like almost like one entity because they were like all like moving in the same direction. It's like that, but fucking cars. They're just like str- it's like a stream, a river of cars, like just constantly coming and coming and coming. So it's um uh, it's absolute nonsense. But I, I think he's adding in some of the stuff to multi threading should be in, so the physics will be a bit better. Um, but yeah, we have a blast doing that every week. At least, you know, I don't know. 
maybe you're con- contractually obliged to have fun at that. I'm not sure what the deal is, but no, dude, I, it always it's fun. so fun. Nobody has I, to be there, it, you know. Yeah, it always feels to me like the the same feeling as you know playing Goldeneye in the basement with your friends. Mm-hmm. Like it just it feels like everyone who's there wants to be there, and it's just kind of like it's it's very competitive, but in the most friendly way possible, where people are like oh. really trying their hardest. But it's no, you know, like I'm still losing off by about that. Oh, about the van. Oh my god. Yeah, that was traumatic. <laughs> I I keep like holding my tongue because I I want to like say to 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 Alex Austin, but it's, it's like so good. Physics yeah, yeah. Really good. <laughs> That's literally his his wheelhouse. But it's like, damn, it feels so good to like drive in the weight of the cars and like. It feels so good. I know that's his specialty, but it's like, so damn. We, we were having yeah, a big chat good. on Monday about the single player, right? And one of the things that came up was like, because we played this thing, right? We played this game. It's a driving game. There's like team modes. You can build your own tracks as a track editor. So most weeks we play a bunch of tracks that the community has made. Um, one of the community members is a guy called Reagan, who did most of the level design on N++, which is a game I absolutely adore. So he's been pumping out the levels for us. Um, but a bunch of other people have been too. But the thing that like I, we were chatting about was like the reason why the game is fun is because the driving model is so good. Like the physics are just like fun. They're like they're not realistic. They're high fidelity is kind of what the term he uses, where they're like fun physics. But it's it's like consistent physics, and because everything is server side, it's like there's no like the la- it's, There's no issues with like weirdnesses, and everything that happens happens to everyone. So then. When when a crazy thing happens and a car flips over and everyone else and lands perfectly and keeps going, everyone sees it, and it feels it feels like a physics sandbox. It feels like when you're playing like Half Life or something, like how fun it is just pick shit up and fuck around with it and stuff like that. Um, but I we were talking about it and I was like, the game is kind of made. Like the game is the driving, and like you almost just want to get out of the way of the game. Like just let it be about the driving. Like we play on simple tracks, and it's fun because the physics are so interesting and weird, and you can bump up against people, and the cars go up on two wheels, and it just feels like tactile and and fun. And we we're talking about this, what to do with the single player, and like you can make it like <coughs> super system or super feature rich and all this sort of stuff. And it was like, what if you just had it like be like i i was exp- i was saying it's like vampire survivors with a core just being in vampire survivors of just walking around and then every once in a while selecting a thing like that's fun and they didn't try and dress it up by putting a story like characters or rpg you know what i mean like they could have but the fun part is already there so i was like when i play this on steam deck when i pick up stunt derby i just want to have an excuse to drive like that's it mm. just give me any fucking any reason to drive so it was funny talking to him about the single player stuff and being like let's just make it about unlocking new cars unlocking new tiles for the editor like we had this idea i think me and jeremy and alex talked about ages ago about having like a sort of a roguelike type mode where every time you did a lap kind of like loop hero then you pick something that changes the level a bit and ups the ante and you have to try and like finish as many levels as you can but it was just cool to realize like oh the game is there like that's the mm. game. It's already fun. It's just you need to create the create the reason why you could play it for infinite amount of time. You know what I mean? Um, it's funny how like games like Battlefield is a game like that too, right? Obviously, you need other people yeah. for it, but like there's certain games that are just like fun to be in, and it's almost the tragedy of a lot of single player story games is that they do end, but you just like to be in that world more. You know, just to be there. Yeah. The Battlefield comparison I also think is kind of apt for Stunt Derby because part of the fun of Battlefield is the um, the like rock, paper, scissors nature of the sandbox experience. And in Stunt Derby, it's very much like, okay, I'm the hatchback. I'm going to try to race ahead. And then you're going to play the van and you're going to try to like go turn around, go the opposite direction. And then if someone is beating me, you're going to try to take them out and stuff. So it's like, it's, it's fun to have a sandbox experience where people are playing different roles. It's almost like the different cars are different classes yeah. or something. By the fu- yeah. by the default but it's like not or like yeah or like the um i love how somebody on the on the on the stunt derby's discord did a breakdown of the the acceleration uh like sort of curves of each one and obviously the van is down the bottom and it was really interesting to see how close the beamer and the hatchback are to each other but the difference is that they control they handle differently so it's like do you like understeer or oversteer is basically the question Mm. there you know i think the hatchback is like slightly higher or beamer has slightly higher top speed but like and the hatchback accelerates faster but it's funny how yeah it's uh it's so tactile like it's so about the feel um yeah and i love how all that stuff is like emerged from it like the van crews you get and 
the fact that in the team mode, because the checkpoints, like we've like sort of stumbled into and like half designed and half stumbled into like a really fun mode where like the things I hate about driving games is that it's 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 just negative feedback loop after negative feedback loop. If you're not in first, you're pissed off because you're not in first. And if you're in first, you have everything to lose. Like and it just feels bad. Like I don't I've never thought that was fun. When you cross the finish line, it's relief. You don't feel like, oh, that was a fun race. You're just like, fuck, I'm glad I got the gold. You know what I mean? Like it doesn't yeah. it doesn't feel fun. So the game the fact that we have this game where like you know, this whole it feels like I'm selling this thing or something. But like genuinely the fact that this like we play this like this team mode where the entire team is on the same checkpoint if one of the cars goes through it. So you can be driving backwards for the entire race and then decide right at the end I'm going to be the leader and just like because your team is like you know two checkpoints from the end of the race you can just be the van who's been negging everyone the entire race and then decide you're the one that's going to cross at the end or you know it's so cool it's it's a blast Stunt Derby pick it up wish list on Steam now <laughs> uh, alright I think that's a pod we talked about a lot of games <clears throat> excuse me Dead Space 2G Charles High Fire Rush GoldenEye 007, Battle Bit Remastered, and plenty more. Uh, like I said, Vampire Survivors Doc coming to Noclip, uh, fingers crossed, this month in February. We also will have another secret one, big AAA studio um, doc coming out that Jeremy's doing awesome work on. Uh, we'll also have the uh, Signalis video essay probably up in a bit. I've just exported Hyperlight Development Episode 2. It's pretty much done and dusted. Um, I'm going to send it around for a bit of review from all you folks. Uh, although you kind of did on the other one, but we'll, we'll do it again um, if you've got the time. Um, and then I'm off next week to film Dwarf Fortress and Choo Choo Charles. And we have some other ones in the can as well. We, we're not quite ready to talk about, but um, loads of stuff coming up on No Clip. And check out Crew in the meantime. I'll have a video on Stunt Derby hopefully out later this week. And we'll probably have some uh, play tests or clip looks or whatever we're calling them on um, some of these games like Dead Space. And we'll have to do Choo Choo probably when I get back as well. That'll be a fun one to have a look at. Um, try and get more videos up there. And that's it. Uh, Jeremy, what are you doing for the rest of your day? Uh, oh, man. I'm doing just a little bit of cleanup on some color grade stuff to send you. Nice. And then uh, I'm probably just going to take it easy. I've literally been working on the Signalis video essay since the last podcast we did. Oh, my God. Uh, and so my brain is just trash. But I'm so excited about that video essay. Uh, I poured myself into it. So I'm very excited for people to see it. It was rad. Did you get to watch it yet, Frank? No, shit. I'm going to watch it after this. Away. I was like, fuck Thanks, yeah, man. fuck yeah. <laughs> it's really good. I think what I like about it as well is I don't think you need to have played Signalis to appreciate it. And I also don't think yeah. it spoils it. Like, I, I, it does, obviously, in some ways, but, like, the story is such a uh, abstract part of that game, weirdly. You know what I mean? Like, you basically did not talk about gameplay once in that entire thing. I know. Which is I actually amazing. was thinking, when I finished it, there's, there's like one or two clips in the entire thing of the of the protagonist shooting a gun right. which is the entire game and I, I was laughing because it's like this is this is almost not about the game itself yeah. like you could watch this and be like oh well, this seems like a fun I game to play i totally think so that's why i in my notes yeah. i was like don't put this spoils the game at the start because i honestly don't think it does like it it can and someone will know maybe what their level of spoil is and if it's a better video mm. essay of a game they should probably but i was like yeah. i weirdly i was like coming away from it being like this, I think, if I hadn't played Signalis and I watched this, I'd probably want to play Signalis because That's it, cool. it kind of like, yeah, because I had more context for it. Kind of like how the second playthrough of Signalis is kind of the best playthrough of Signalis, maybe. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's a game about time loops, so you gotta, you can't just play it once. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so that's coming up on, on Crew 2. Frank, what are you doing for the rest of your day? Uh, Wednesday's comic book day, so I already <laughs> picked up my comics. Uh, trying to take care of my mental health this week. I like. I've been hiking exclusively for like three or four months and I, I hit like a good weight and now I'm like, I should, I should probably go to the gym now and like d switch it up and, and see where I go from there. I like avoided the gym because like I have this weird like, I don't know what you call it. Like last time I went to the gym is like when I got a bunch of bad news. I was right. like, a, like a lot of scary stuff was happening. So there's this like, I have to do exposure therapy, like no go and you'll be okay. So it's been this like, it's like a boss and it's like, no, I'm going to go in and, and I'm not going to get an earth shattering text <laughs> message. So, um, um, no, yeah. So I, I, I'm just, yeah, just, just taking care of myself and figuring stuff out. Um, and again, like, thank you everyone here with no clip and like, I don't know. It's uh, like, yeah, we, uh, even before we started the podcast, I was like, I mm. feel like I'm in a fog this week, but even Jeremy alleviated it and talking about Goldeneye and N64 and, and uh, Roblox Battlefield makes me happy. <laughs> yeah. So thank you, everyone. Nice. Uh, Take care oh, yeah, of yourself. Totally. Yeah. And thanks to everyone who supports us yeah. and keeps us 
doing this work. We're going to do a funding push. Um, I'm going to see if we can do it this month, but there's so much stuff. We, we've It's a typical thing. We never have time to ask for more funding because we're too busy doing <laughs> making documentaries. But um, uh, this big videotape project, we're going to need some some help to do it properly. It's going to be it's going to take years. It's it's really important, I think, for fucking video game history. Like it, it must be the biggest archive of analog video game history in the world. <laughs> the, and a lot, most of which is not online. And like what the fuck is on you know i've already gone th- i've talked about it the past couple of weeks like the stuff that's on these little tapes here what's really annoying is i'm waiting at the moment i'm waiting for like um what do you call the ends of component cables and composite cables whatever that fucking thing is that to sdi i'm waiting for a bunch of plugs from amazon they've been delayed for like a week and i'm like fuck there's a, there's one store in in san rafael actually that only sells old like hi-fi tech so i should probably go down there because it's insane it's like going down and they have every tiny little thing you could imagine and it's all they sell it's just like like this tiny screw that you would need for this like dvd player from you know or this it's absolutely insane so i should probably go down there and check it out a L- little different but i once got to go to bh oh, photo nice. like their actual warehouse nice. store in new york oh my god i that's like i haven't thought about bh oh. photo in like a decade but like that's like we got our video yeah we, i mean we bought our c300 <laughs> off of B H. uh B and H is great because they're Jewish owned, so you can't order off their website on Sundays. Isn't that right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Is it Sundays? I think it's Sundays, right? I'm yeah. not Jewish. I don't. Yeah, know. I don't it sounds know. right. Yeah, but free, shipping? free for for the longest time, yeah. and maybe it was like free shipping, and then like no taxes yeah, really or something, something yeah. like that. So we get stuff crazy. off B and H all the time. The latest, I got a Sennheiser um, um, mic, uh, like a like a pretty good shotgun mic, um, and yeah, it was free delivery in like two days. Use offer code NoClip. <laughs> 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 yeah, good old BNH. Um, yeah, I was gonna ask Danny, what are you yeah, doing I don't today? Yeah, getting week? this stuff. I've my my I've been also doing a lot of hiking um, since moving to beautiful Novato. Mount Burdell is right there, and there's a bunch of loops I was doing. And when all the rain was happening, I was like a pig in shit because like there was nobody up there. I could go on like and I, walking in the rain is like fucking you know I'm Irish so it was like easy peasy lemon squeezy so I was having a great time put on my rain max go up there my boots at the cross over rivers and shit I did it with my daughter a couple of times um, it was a lot of fun uh, so I've been enjoying that like trying to get out a bit more I've done a bad job this week and also I have a little bit of a chest infection which is annoying me I used to get these all the time in Ireland I'd have a chest infection for a long time and I'd never go get um, <clears throat> antibiotics for it and stuff like that but so we should, probably should have but like most chest infections last like seven days and I'm on like day eight and I'm like well, I can't go what's the point of going to the doctor now it'll be gone in like three days and I know what it feels like like I've had these so often that I'm like oh it's just one of those um, but it's been messing my sleep up a bit so that's been messing my exercise up a bit so then you know what I mean if you can't get the sleep right almost everything else is like downstream so um, this morning I was supposed to I mean, I'm hiking in the morning or, or exercising in the morning or doing like a bit of self care but this morning I wanted to get in and do a bunch of shit I'm, so I'm forcing myself this afternoon to go and chill out for a little while and do some shit outdoors um, nice. but yeah we got a bunch of stuff done this morning so one of the cool things about video and you, all, you guys all know this as well is that like sometimes you just have to render something and it's going to take like two hours, you know, or an hour, 40 minutes or whatever. Or you have to upload something. That's the big thing in the studio because this fucking shitty internet, it costs like $500 a month. Thank you. <laughs> Patreon.com slash no clip if you want to help us out. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I'm, I have a bunch of that stuff got to process and I'll just leave for a while and, and do that. But, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, that's, uh, that's my plan for the rest of the day. Thank you, everyone. Watch the docs on YouTube. Listen to the podcast. You already do that. I don't know why I say that. Drop us a review on your podcast thing of choice if you want hey everyone on youtube watching these what's going on what's up uh and that's it patron show probably hitting for the patrons soon we did a production to your team uh, meeting last week which was very fun told them all the secrets of all the shit that's coming out and you didn't fucking know about and they knew about fan parts of art for you that noclip.com patreon whatever fucking all right <laughs> that's the show i'm out of here <laughs> bye everyone Video games. Video games. Video. Wait, no.